We are following a developing story out of Waterbury. There's been a shooting outside of the city's courthouse. Courtrooms are usually the scenes of legal dispute rather than violence. That if this case goes forward without additional funding, there's no chance. But what happens when victims take matters into their own hands? From the mother who took revenge on her daughter's killer in the courtroom, to a gang member who was brutally murdered by over 200 women in broad daylight. These are the cases of convicts who got instantly killed in court. Klaus Grabowski. This is Marianne Bachmeier, the woman who would come to be known as Germany's revenge mother. And this is Klaus Grabowski, the brutal murderer who snatched the life of an innocent soul. On a fateful day in March 1981, the grieving mother walked into a courtroom in West Germany with a concealed gun, and within a split second she served proper justice for the man who took her daughter from her. Before the tragedy struck, Marianne was a single mother who ran a pub in the 1970s in the city of Lübeck, West Germany. All her life, Marianne had seen struggles of all kinds, from a troubled upbringing to having two children she had to put up for adoption. However, when she got pregnant again the third time, Marianne decided to keep this one for herself, and she named the charming baby Anna. Anna was a ray of sunshine in Marianne's life. She brought a new kind of happiness that she hadn't felt in a long, long time. However, as they say, good things don't last long. And so was the story of Anna, who eventually became the victim of a psychopath. It was on May 5, 1980, when tragedy struck. On that day, seven-year-old Anna and her mother had a heated argument, and out of rebellion, she decided to skip school. Somehow, she found herself in the house of her 35-year-old neighbor, Klaus Grabowski. This guy wasn't the most upstanding citizen around, and as a matter of fact, he had previously served time for doing the unthinkable with a minor. But Grabowski wasn't a stranger to Anna, and this wasn't the first time she would go over to his place to play with his cat. However, this time Grabowski had deadly intentions towards the little girl. And after a few hours had passed, he pounced on little Anna and strangled her with a pantyhose. Whether or not Anna was defiled remains unknown, however. Grabowski completed his evil mission by stashing the child's body in a cardboard box and burying her on the banks of a nearby canal. But justice was not far behind, and it was on that very day that Grabowski got arrested after his fiancée alerted the cops. With all fingers pointing directly at him, he knew he couldn't run from this one, so he admitted to murdering the child but denied ever abusing her. Instead, he gave a more disturbing story. He claimed the seven-year-old tried to seduce him and even threatened to tell her mother he assaulted her if he didn't give her money. Not a lot of people bought that story, and the police definitely didn't. So the case headed to court, but that was where things got even worse. At the trial, Grabowski's lawyers put up a defense claiming that he acted out of a hormonal imbalance which was caused by the voluntary castration procedure he underwent years prior. The story wasn't so amusing for Marianne, and each statement seemed like a punch to her chest. So on the third day of the trial, she walked into that Lubeck district court with a 22 caliber Beretta pistol tucked within her purse, her eyes were bloodshot, and it was obvious she was out for revenge. When she found a good vantage point, she pulled out that gun and aimed straight for Grabowski, firing seven shots without batting an eyelid, one for each year Anna lived. Many called it a fitting end to such a psychopath. But the law still had to punish Marianne for the murder. During her murder trial, she spoke of taking Grabowski's life in a dream and seeing visions of her daughter. This solidified her resolve and she had to do what she did. When the court asked her for a handwriting sample, she wrote, I did it for you, Anna. The court slammed her with a six-year sentence for premeditated manslaughter in 1983, and her conviction caused a few ruckus, as many argued that she wasn't supposed to serve any time for the act. Marianne would go on to spend only three years behind bars before she was released. Sadly, though, she was diagnosed with cancer and died on September 14, 1996, at the age of 46. She was buried right next to her daughter. Aku Yadav. This is Bharat Kalacharan, also known as Aku Yadav, an Indian gangster who was lynched in a courtroom in broad daylight. How did he get here, and what horrible crimes did he commit to deserve such a harsh punishment? To understand this chilling case, let's take a little trip back to the past. 
Before he met his inglorious end, Aku Yadav was a terror to the society. He was a robber, home invader, kidnapper, extortionist, and serial killer whose name struck fear in the hearts of everyone around. During his lifetime, Yadav took the lives of at least three individuals. He tortured and abducted people for ransom and assaulted over 40 women and underage girls. But for a very long time, he and his gangs were unstoppable since they had the police in their pockets. They would often give them money and even take them out for drinks in bars, so even when the women reported him to the police, their cases were thrown out the window. He terrorized the families, mostly those living in Kasturba Nagar, and he would sometimes barge into their houses demanding money. To keep the men under his toes, he would assault the women, and even children as young as 10 years old. This way, the men would not be able to rebel against him. It was said that during this time, Every household in the area had at least one woman who had fallen victim to Yadav's assaults. One of their victims was a woman who had given birth just 10 days prior. Yadav and his men defiled the woman, who would later take her own life by immolation. Before you ask why the people didn't go to the police when the situation got so bad, they actually did. And as a matter of fact, the police arrested him 14 times. But what came out of it? Nothing. Yadav would simply be released right back onto the streets to keep terrorizing the people of the locality. After a whole decade of causing havoc and destroying the lives of the women and girls who lived in the area, all cases against him were dropped, and it looked as though the 32-year-old psychopath would get away with it. The story would eventually take a dark turn on August 13, 2004, during a bail hearing in India's Nagpur District Court. Word had spread that Yadav could be released that day, as the police had planned to keep him in custody until everyone had calmed down, then released him. Left with no choice but to take matters into their own hands, a mob of 200 to 400 women marched into the courthouse on that day, armed with vegetable knives and pepper spray. They took their seats in the front row as Yadav walked in confidently, knowing he was going to be a free man soon. During the court proceedings, he saw a woman he had assaulted in the past, and he laughed at her, calling her unprintable names. The police supposedly laughed too. Soon, another woman started hitting him in the head with a chapal, boldly declaring to Yadav that it was either she ended his life or he ended hers, saying, We can't both live on this earth together. It's either you or me. Those bold words emboldened the other women, and before you could say Jack Robinson, Yadav was surrounded by the women who stabbed him a staggering 70 times. The chili powder was thrown in the faces of the officers who guarded him, and as they dealt the final punishment on him, he could be heard screaming and begging for forgiveness. The scene was very bloody, and one victim was said to have hacked off his private part. The police left the place dazed and horrified, but while the vigilante may be questionable, nobody really felt any pity for the brutal gangster. Although some of the women were charged with the murder, there wasn't enough evidence to convict them, and even if the case was pursued, the chances of their conviction was slim to none. So they were released, and today they are hailed as heroines in India. David Paradiso While standing trial for stabbing his girlfriend, David Paradiso caused a huge chaos in the courtroom, a move that eventually led to his demise. The real reason Paradiso was in court that day was because of a brutal attack he launched on his innocent girlfriend, stabbing her in the neck and dumping her body near a road. The details of the crime were quite shocking, and they sent shockwaves through the community. On the day the crime was committed, Paradiso and his girlfriend Eileen Pelt were arguing at the back seat of his mom's car. Nobody could really remember what the fight was about, but it soon turned violent. The 29-year-old Paradiso would later claim he was suffering from paranoia at the time, and he actually believed that his girlfriend was going to take his life if he didn't attack first. After brutally murdering his girlfriend, Paradiso then took his mother hostage, forcing her to drive to the neighboring Amador County, where he disposed of the body. He was soon apprehended by the authorities and the whirlwind trial began, although no one could predict that it would all end in tragedy. The nature of the case was very peculiar, but Paradiso's defense claimed he was high on hard drugs at the time of the incident, while his mother kept mentioning his deteriorating mental state. On March 4, 2009, the day of the attack, 
Paradiso took to the witness stand to retell his version of the story, and during the proceedings, the court decided to take a brief recess. But as the individuals filed out of the courtroom, Paradiso targeted the San Joaquin County Superior Court Judge Cinda Fox, who was sitting on the case, stabbing her with an unknown weapon. The whole courtroom was thrown into disarray, and during the chaos, the officers shot him in the head, ending his life in an instant. It was a brutal punctuation to a troubled life, but Paradiso's mother saw it coming. She claimed to have informed the officers about Paradiso's mental state and how he was prone to violence prior to the incident. She also mentioned how she had informed the officers that her son had a concealed weapon, but no one took her seriously. Thankfully, though, Judge Cinda Fox, who was a victim of the unexpected attack, only sustained minor injuries, and as she was wheeled out of the courtroom, she could be heard assuring reporters that she was okay. For Paradiso, though, that was the end of the road, and his story remains one of the most chilling examples of criminals getting unintended capital punishment right within the courtroom. Sial Angelao. This gang member was standing trial for several charges in a court in Salt Lake City when he made a stupid decision that ultimately ended his life abruptly. 25-year-old Sial Angelao was an alleged member of the Tongan Crip Gang one of the deadliest criminal groups in Utah. Angelao was part of the 17 suspects named in a 29-count racketeering indictment filed in 2008, accusing the gang members of conspiracy, assault, robbery, and illegal possession of weapons. The 6'3", 260-pound Angelao was also implicated in a string of robberies and assault on local store clerks. And in addition, he was accused of assaulting two federal officers as well as brandishing a firearm. The case had gone on for a while, and Angelao was the last defendant to stand trial, which was why his conviction was important. On this fateful day in 2014, a prison inmate who apparently knew all about the inner workings of the gang took the stand against Angelao, and this didn't sit right with the suspected gangster. To add fire to the fuel, court officials decided that day to keep Angelao unrestrained in front of the jury hoping and believing that he would not do anything stupid. Unluckily for him, he actually did. As the witness began narrating his testimony, Angelao stood up from his seat, armed himself with a pen, and ran towards the witness box. He launched himself at the witness, and within a split seconds, four shots were heard, and the man was downed. It was a federal U.S. Marshal who fired those final shots, hitting Angelao in the chest. The whole courtroom was thrown into shock and panic as officers tried to evacuate everyone from the scene. The witness was also taken away from the scene, and that pretty much wrapped up the case. But the story doesn't end there. Angelao's death sparked the age-long debate of how racial prejudice influences the American justice system. His family argued that the officers used excessive force in dealing with the situation, and that Angelao's attack could have been stopped without snuffing his life out. On the other side, there were people who didn't exactly subscribe to this theory. They believed that Angelao knew what the consequences of attacking someone in the courtroom would be, especially in such a case that required the presence of federal officers. So it seemed he reacted in a moment of anger after seeing the said witness, and paid dearly for his outburst. His family would later file a lawsuit claiming that his rights were violated, but that only achieved little, and the case was eventually thrown out. Nathaniel Richmond. Back in 2017, this Ohio judge found himself in a precarious situation after the father of a suspect showed up in court with murder on his mind. It was around 8 a.m. on Monday, August 21, 2017, when the events unfolded at the Jefferson County Courthouse in Steubenville. Judge Joseph J. Brzeze Jr. was walking towards the building when he spotted a car waiting for him at a bank parking lot. As the judge approached, one of the men got out of the car and suddenly opened fire on the judge. That man was Nathaniel Richmond. But how exactly did Richmond and Judge Brzee's cross paths, and why did their encounter end in a tragedy? According to court records, Richmond was a plaintiff in a wrongful death lawsuit that the judge was overseeing. This haunting lawsuit involved the death of Richmond's own mother in a house fire in Steubenville earlier in 2015. But that's not where it ends. Richmond was also the father of a former high school football player, Malik Richmond, 
who was convicted of assault in a highly publicized trial back in 2013. So a lot of people believe the man was embittered by his constant brushes with the justice system and decided to take out his frustration on the judge. Or maybe he was just seeking an easy way to get out of the case. Either way, his plan would eventually backfire and the hunter became the hunted. Initially, Richmond held the upper hand, holding a gun to the judge and even shooting him in the stomach. But this judge was not willing to go down without a fight. In a strange twist no one saw coming, Bruzesa got up and brought out his own gun, firing at the suspect as he fled to the getaway car. Another officer also noticed the exchange of fire and joined in, shooting at the attacker until he could no longer run. As the smoke cleared, the judge was airlifted to a hospital in Pittsburgh, and after undergoing surgery, he was able to make it out alive. The same cannot be said for Richmond, who died right in front of that courthouse. CCTV footage of the encounter was eventually released, and it showed that the attack was a basic ambush. The other suspect who drove the getaway car was also apprehended, and he faced a heavy penalty for his role in the whole incident. The shooting shocked the community, and it also highlighted the dangers that some judicial officials have to face when dealing with some of the most hardened criminals in America. Now it's time for our subscribers' pick. In the hallowed halls of the justice system, some cases are more peculiar than the others, like that of Marianne Bachmeyer, a woman stricken by the loss of her daughter at the hand of a hardened criminal. Without batting an eyelid, Marianne walked into that courtroom on that day with one intention and one intention only, to take the life of the man who took her daughter from her. She claimed she actually wanted to shoot him in the face, but instead, she chose to attack him from the back. And with those seven shots, she eventually evened the score in a way the justice system could never have. However, her vigilante story had also attracted criticism from some people, who believed that Marianne should have trusted the justice system to deliver the appropriate punishment. They claimed that killing a killer only made her a killer as well. However, that sentiment is disputed by the larger percentage, who see her as a heroine and a figure of justice. Do you think Marianne made the right decision by taking the life of her daughter's killer? Or do you believe there is no justification for extrajudicial killings? Share your thoughts with us in the comments section down below. Now, let's get back to the video. Brian Nichols. This is Brian Nichols on the day of his trial, just before he brutally murdered four people in the courtroom thinking he could get away with it. The chilling event took place on March 11, 2005, while Nichols was on his way to answer for his assault charges. In addition to the assault, Nichols was also charged with kidnapping and the assault of yet another victim who was a former girlfriend. His trial was a roller coaster, and the first attempt ended with a mistrial. While awaiting the second trial, his family and friends expressed their concerns that he would try to run away, but no one took their claims seriously. Unfortunately, when he finally did, he took several other innocent lives along with him. The attack started with Sheriff Deputy Cynthia Hall, whom Nichols found while she was changing clothes at the Fulton County Courthouse. He managed to steal her Glock service pistol before subsequently beating her into a coma, but he wasn't done yet. After changing into civilian clothes intended to be used during the trials, Nichols formulated his escape plan, which involved a whole lot of chaos and a dash of bloodshed. First, he encountered case managers Susan Christie and Gina Clark Thomas, as well as attorney David Allman, holding them all at gunpoint and demanding they lead him to the chambers of Judge Barnes, who was presiding over his case. One man, Sergeant Grantley White, attempted to disarm the suspect but failed, and he joined the list of hostages. However, White had also triggered an alarm which Nichols tried to dispel using White's radio. After a little dramatic display, Nichols walked into the Judge Barnes's courtroom and opened fire, brutally taking Barnes's life, as well as shooting court reporter Julianne Brandau. While trying to escape from the courtroom, Nichols also fatally shot Sergeant Hoyt Teasley, bringing his total victim count to four. He was able to escape from the scene by stealing cars and holding people at gunpoint to do his bidding, and for a while, he thought he had escaped. The manhunt for Nichols was one of the hottest America has ever seen, and it was even featured on America's Most Wanted, with a reward of $65,000 offered to anyone who could help in his arrest. 
With the entire security force searching for Nichols, he got scared and desperate, so he decided to kidnap a young woman named Ashley Smith to use as a pawn in his escape plan. On that same day, Nichols also encountered ICE Special Agent David G. Wilhelm and fatally shot him before stealing his badge, gun, and pickup truck. Unfortunately for him, though, the victim was able to contact the cops before she was abducted, and it didn't take long for the police to show up at her apartment in Duluth, Georgia. Nichols would eventually surrender to the officers after holding Smith hostage for seven straight hours, marking an unremarkable to such an octane-filled situation. He was then taken to a FBI office in Decatur, Georgia, and then to a police station in Atlanta, where he confessed the details of his crimes on video. He was eventually indicted on May 5, 2005 on 54 counts, which included murder, felony murder, kidnapping, armed robbery, aggravated assault, theft, carjacking, and escape from authorities to mention a few. Initially, he pleaded not guilty, with his lawyers citing insanity as probable grounds for his acquittal. But the Fulton County attorney did not buy the story. He sought capital punishment. After deliberating for just 12 hours, the jury found Nichols guilty of all the 54 counts leveled against him on November 7, 2008. Less than a month later, on December 13, 2008, he was slammed with multiple life sentences with no possibility of parole. Although the goal was to make the criminal face the death penalty, Georgia law made this quite impossible, so the prosecution had to settle with the life sentences. Nichols is currently incarcerated in Georgia Diagnostic and Classification State Prison, where he will likely spend the rest of his life. Michael Marin. On June 28, 2012, American financier, lawyer, and ex-Wall Street trader Michael Marin shocked the world when he took his own life during a court hearing. But how did a millionaire who had everything he needed find himself in this precarious situation? It's a story that takes us back to 2009, when Marin allegedly started a fire in his million-dollar Arizona mansion. Apparently, he was facing some financial problems, and he couldn't afford the mortgage on his home, so he tried auctioning it off, but that didn't work. Out of desperation, he even climbed Mount Everest, thinking the publicity from that would help drive the sale of his home. But that also didn't work out. After all his options had failed, Marin became increasingly frustrated. And so one day, he decided to set the house on fire before escaping using a rope ladder and dressed in scuba suits. He was soon arrested and charged with arson, marking the start of a sensationalized trial that destroyed whatever hopes Marin had left. As the trial began in May 2012, Marin's attorney informed him that he could be facing up to 16 years in prison for the crime, and that seemed to have been the last straw for him. As the trial proceeded, he knew the odds were stacked against him, and on the final day of the trial, his worst fear was confirmed. He was declared guilty as charged, but just before his sentence was handed down, Nichols did something shocking. Video of the sentencing shows Nichols apparently putting something in his mouth, and minutes later, he mysteriously collapsed. He was immediately rushed to the hospital where he passed away, and during autopsies, medical personnel found toxic substances in his system, which meant that he probably took a poisonous substance in that courtroom. This suspicion would eventually be confirmed after officers searched his car and found a canister labeled cyanide. Apparently, Nichols purchased the deadly substance in the previous year, after he realized the case would not turn out in his favor. His son also received what appeared to be his final note, along with his will, which meant that the actions were premeditated. But prior to his death, Marin was a socialist who enjoyed the finest things of life, traveling, partying, and making more money than he knew what to do with. How he lost all that money and had to resort to desperate means of survival remains a mystery, and thanks to the dramatic courtroom display, his story continues to be told many years after his death. Thank you for watching this video. See you in the next one.